Greetings from New York City and Columbia Business School Executive Education. I'm Scott Gardner, and I'm here today with Professor Paul Ingram for today's webinar, What Leaders Need to Know to Lead Through Crisis. Before I introduce Paul, I'd like to go over a few quick logistics. If you'll look at your screens, a recording of this webinar will be made available to you. If you'd like to tweet about this webinar, please do so at hashtag CBSExecEd. And finally, most importantly, please submit those questions throughout the webinar and we'll get to as many of those as possible in the last 10 minutes. My pleasure to introduce Professor Paul Ingram. He is the Kravis Professor of Business at Columbia Business School, where he has received the Dean's Award for Teaching Excellence, as well as being awarded the Commitment to Excellence Awards voted by graduating executive MBA students five times. His research has been published in more than 60 articles, books, and book chapters. His publications have received numerous awards. He has consulted on issues of organizational design and strategy to leading companies in the finance, healthcare, insurance, energy, and consumer products industries. He is also the faculty director of the Advanced Management Program, Columbia Executive Education's flagship program for senior executives from around the globe. Paul, it's great to be with you today. Before I leave the stage, I'll join you for the last 10 minutes. Let me just ask you one thing. What is a crisis? What is a crisis? Yes. <laughs> oh, thanks, Scott. That's a great question to get us started. So I think about a crisis as a confluence of two inputs. One is that the stakes are high. Now this has implications for our human performance. You know, there's stress, there's these challenges to the leader and the people, um, the leaders responsible for it being at their best. The second input to a crisis is that the problems being dealt with are unforeseen. There's no programmed response. We don't know the answer to the challenges we face in a crisis, right? So a combination, of high stakes, unforeseen problems. Now, the fact that a crisis emerges from unforeseen problems is part of why we're so interested in crisis leadership at this moment. We are actually in a world of organizations and business where unforeseen problems are visiting us more often. Why is that? Well, it's because really that the context we're operating in is becoming more complex. Factors like globalization, competition, technology are causing the elements that combine for the, to explain the success of our actions to be more and more interdependent, such that if something changes in a complex system in one place, we're not quite sure what the implication is going to be somewhere else. Right? So because complexity is increasing, we are in a world of leadership now where the unforeseen and responding to the unforeseen is more and more important. This means it's more likely we're gonna be visited by crisis, but perhaps even more important for us, the same challenges of unforeseen problems happen to us every day as leaders, even if the stakes don't reach uh, the level that makes them a crisis, right? So this is, I think, a really exciting dimension to thinking about crisis leadership. Uh, if you can become a better crisis leader, then the payoff is not only in these relatively rare but important moments uh, where the stakes are the highest and you're dealing with uncertainty, but you could also be more effective in the everyday engagement with complexity and the uncertainty that comes out of it. So really, uh, in the discussion about the inputs to successful crisis leadership, uh, I think we also see a window into just effective leadership in our era of complexity. Right? So I'm gonna to return to the concept of leadership after an engagement with crises. Uh, and at the end of this short talk, I'm gonna to return to this framework of integrated leadership that we use at the Columbia Business School to think about the things that the leader is responsible for, leading him or herself, leading others, what we call interpersonal leadership, and leading the organization strategically. And we're going to see that the same best practices that help produce a success in a moment of crisis actually pay off in calmer moments as well. But now, to crises specifically. I'm gonna offer you a way of thinking about best practices for dealing with crisis that divides the crisis into three moments. What does a leader do before the crisis to prepare? How does the leader make the most of the opportunities for success in a moment of crisis? And then how do you go from the crisis back to business as usual? How do you leave the crisis moment and return to a thriving organization? Start with the pre-crisis moment. So the first 
the best practice I'd like to talk about is strategizing. Now, good leaders know the significance of strategy. In a sense, we think about this as the input to everything else. What does a strategy do? Well, a strategy focuses on how the organization is going to win and lets everybody in the organization know what are the key priorities, what's most important to pursue to achieve that winning proposition. Now, it's important for every organization, but it is particularly important in producing a success in a crisis. Think about some of the things that often happen in a crisis. The capacity to communicate and coordinate in real time is typically destroyed or inhibited. You might have parts of the organization that are cut off from each other because they don't have direct communications. Even if there were feasible challenges of communications, the demands of the moment, such as the need to respond quickly, may mean that the leader can't get together with all parts of the organization and discuss what should be done and why. So this means that you need decisions in decentralized parts of the organizations in moments of crisis. And for those to be good decisions, they have to be aligned with what's happening in the rest of the organization. So how do you produce that? Well, someone in one isolated department or one outpost of the organization that's making a key decision in a moment of crisis, if you're going to produce this alignment, they need to know what the organization is trying to achieve and what is most important. If that's really clear to them, then you don't need direct communication or even super supervision from the leaders of the organization. The remote outpost will be making decisions which is pulling in the same direction and moving the whole organization forward. You establish this before the moment of crisis. It comes from the leader setting strategy, communicating strategy, making sure the strategy is thoroughly understood throughout the organization. Now, the second preparation for a crisis I'd like to talk about is planning. I'm going to argue that planning is important to best prepare for a crisis, but we also have to understand exactly how uh, the plans are going to be used, and it might not be as we expect. Let me tell you about an example that we use at the Columbia Business School for Crisis Leadership. It's actually one of our alumni who had a really important leadership opportunity uh, in a moment of crisis, actually, around the uh, 2012 earthquake and tsunami in Japan. So our leader was responsible for a logistics organization uh, in that country at this time. And Ultimately, his organization ended up uh, providing aid, communicating necessary information, and contributing to saving lives and property. But I like to talk about how the leader prepared for the leadership assignment. When the leader found out that he would be running this organization of 3,000 people in Japan, he began by establishing a set of plans for potential contingencies, you know, things that could visit the organization and affect its success factors uh, that might not be um, business as usual. And actually, the leader prepared 11 plans. Uh, these plans involved getting expert input, think, talking about members of the organization, about how they would react, and ultimately doing some training for the organization. Right? So 11 plans were put into place. These plans included, among the 11, there was a plan for dealing with an earthquake, a plan for dealing with a tsunami, and even a plan for dealing with a potential nuclear disaster. However, there was no plan that described the actual situation as it occurred, which was the confluence of an earthquake, a tsunami, and a potential nuclear disaster. That couldn't be foreseen. Right? So there was no plan that could be taken off the shelf and actually implemented at that uh, moment of crisis. However, the leader is completely committed to the idea that having gone through those plans, which were part of what ultimately happened, made the organization better able to respond in the moment. Let me give you another angle on this approach to planning. I'll tell you about um, another Colombian, actually somebody who was the president of Columbia University before he was the president of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower. So Dwight Eisenhower is renowned for saying that plans are worthless, but planning is everything. I think what he means by that is that the plan itself will never describe the unexpected situation as it actually occurs. Right? So you can't 
claim foresight uh, that would allow you to pre-program your response to a crisis. As we said, the crisis is unexpected by definition. However, the act of planning, which involves understanding your resources, including the human resources, thinking about how they may interact with each other and the context that you're operating in, that gives you the raw material to respond to the unexpected. In other words, it gives you the capacity to improvise. Now, speaking of improvisation, I'd like to give you another example from lessons that we use on crisis leadership at the Columbia Business School. Here we are in New York City, which happens to be the world center of the industry for jazz music. And we regularly bring uh, jazz bands into our business school classroom to teach leaders about how organizations operate in a way which is very responsive and innovative. If you think about what a jazz band does, they're an organization that does something different every time they go to work. Right? Now, this is a extreme case, but it's a great model for the capacities that are necessary with dealing with the unexpected that crisis represents. So one of the fascinating things we learned from the jazz uh, musicians is that everything they do is in the moment, spontaneous response to each other, an improvisation. But the way they do it is by thousands of hours of careful and deliberate, diligent practice alone. So in other words, it's because they master their instrument, the sound, their capacity to interact with their bandmates, that they're able to respond in the moment. As one of these jazz musician teachers once told uh, some of our business executives, the preparation allows them to have a dancing mind and a thinking body. What they mean is the act of actually interacting with their instrument and producing music becomes automatic. It's something that they don't have to dedicate any cognitive resources to. Because of that, their mind can dance. It can read the situation, it can respond, and it can improvise. So that's what I'd like you to think about in terms of planning. Realize that you're never going to be able to follow a plan in a moment of true crisis. But nevertheless, the act of having prepared the planning makes you capable of responding in the moment of improvising. Now let's get to the moment of crisis. So we're dealing with unexpected problems. One of the challenges of success in a crisis is understanding the situation, which we call sense-making, and then deciding on a best path through. Leaders have to be humble about this problem. Uh, what I'd like to communicate is that you should not expect to be the source of the best answers for navigating a crisis. There's no reason to expect that the leader would be the one who has either the expert uh, experience or the perspective to make the biggest success in an unforeseen situation. Right? The leaders might be the experts in the foreseen situation, but when things are new, anybody could have the key insight. So this means you have to lead in a certain way. The label we use for this kind of leadership is that the leader has to produce psychological safety. What that means really, someone has psychological safety if they're willing to say what they believe, what they see, even if it is different from what the leader believes and sees, and even if the rest of the group doesn't agree. Right? So in other words, if they will give their unique perspective. That's what you need in a moment of complexity, unforeseen problems. You need to hear the best ideas from everybody around you. The leader has to enable that. It doesn't happen automatically. A couple of the things we teach leaders to do to produce psychological safety are listen. People have more psychological safety, more likely to say what they believe and see if they think they're being listened to. And also to give space for members of a team to give their perspective. Right? So the leader, in some sense, has to step off stage and create some space for the team to offer what they can for a success. So a style of leadership that produces psychological safety. I'd like to say something about hierarchy. So hierarchy has a kind of mixed relationship to organizational success. Sometimes it's actually very effective, but in a moment of crisis, hierarchy inhibits success and a leader has to relax hierarchy. I'd like to give you an example to illustrate this. I've got a colleague, Adam Galinsky, who did some fascinating research where he looked at teams that 
attempted to climb the Himalayan mountains. And he looked particular about how hierarchical the team was and used that to predict their outcomes. And he found that hierarchy was simultaneously associated with the team being more likely to succeed by reaching the summit, but also more likely to suffer deaths in their effort to climb. So let's think about that duality. When does a team succeed climbing a mountain? Well, when things roll out as they had planned and expected, when the weather holds out, when the equipment works, in other words, when there's no crisis. When do teams suffer deaths climbing a mountain, when the weather doesn't turn out as expected, when the equipment breaks down and they're visited with a crisis. Right? So in everyday moments, hierarchy is very useful. If the organization is executing on a plan of success that it knows is the right one, hierarchy helps them do that. But in a moment of crisis, when you need more full input from unexpected parts of the organization, hierarchy is an enemy. So in the moment of crisis, leaders have to relax hierarchy, which doesn't mean they should give up on it completely. You'd like to reserve it for moments when the organization is executing. Let me say something about networks. So a network is really a robust structure of information and favors. The advantage of networks in moments of crisis is uh, an old network contact, somebody you worked with 10 years ago, could provide help or information that is unforeseen. In other words, we don't know exactly what our network contacts might do with us, do for us. So when we're dealing with unforeseen problems, this is a particularly useful source of help. So leaders should call on their networks in moments of crisis. And finally, I'd like to say something about leading yourself. The stakes are high in a moment of crisis. Uh, one of the big threats to the leader and therefore to the team is that the leader could get overwhelmed by this stress, um, could panic, could lose track of the objective of the organization. If the leader does that, it's gonna happen to others in the organization. So the leader has to remain grounded and centered. So at the Columbia Business School, we spend a lot of time on helping the leader lead herself. And we've got a number of tools. One of them is what we call a values hierarchy. This helps the leader see what's most important to her. And in moments of crisis, when you could get distracted from what's most important, it allows the leader to center herself and be her best self and pursue the objectives that will bring about success. We find that when leaders have access to this tool that we help them produce, they make better decisions, they're calmer, uh, they induce trust in the people they're leading, and they're even more ethical, right? So it serves well in a moment of crisis. Now, some of these things that you need in a crisis remind us about, again, some extra dimensions to preparation. Since you need to call on networks in crises, you've got to think about establishing them before the crisis hits, right? So you can't build a trusting relationship in the moment of crisis to somebody you didn't know before, right? So effective leaders build up their social capital, their networks throughout decades of a career, and then they call on them in the moment of crisis, but you've got to establish the resource before. And also, the leader has to build the self-awareness that allow her to be her best self in the moment of crisis. For example, learning about her values. Now this brings us to post-crisis. It's tempting after a crisis has passed to just savor the relief and put it behind, maybe not even think about negative things, but that's a wasted opportunity. Crises provide a rare opportunity for learning and effective leaders make the most of that opportunity. So turning the organization to extracting lessons learned, things they can do to prepare their strategies, their organization, the teams, the relationships, so they'll be better able to respond to the next crisis. It won't be a version exactly of the last one, but again, you can build your capacity for improvising by making the most of learning. And finally, repairing strained relationships. These could be inside the organization, they could be outside the organization with customers, uh, suppliers, regulators, and so on. This involves honesty, uh, facing up to what actually happened in the crisis, and trying to let these stakeholders know that it's gonna be less likely the organization is gonna be visited by these challenges again. So let me finish by returning to the concepts of effective leadership um, that I introduced at the beginning of this talk. Here are 
many of these best practices that I talked about at different moments of a crisis organized in terms of the leader's responsibility, what the leader has to do to know him or herself, know her values, cultivate her capacity for growing across time, building relationships and establishing teams and cultures and organization that share a common ground that allows them to collaborate in ways that may not be foreseen by the organizational chart, strategizing and building flexibility into organizations. These are all things that pay off for success in a crisis. But as we see them here, I hope you recognize as I do that these are also inputs for effective leadership uh, in the everyday moments that become more and more common in our lives uh, these days when we're faced with problems we don't foresee. Right? So a lot of the same things that help us respond to crisis also help us be effective leaders in the current era of complexity and change. Uh, and I think this just makes it all the more worthwhile to invest in these capacities as leaders as we help our students do at the Columbia Business School. You might say that these days we are all crisis leaders. So that's my message, Scott. Um, are there any questions? Paul, oh, a lot of great questions came in. Thank you so much. I think this is enormously good information. And your last statement, I think everybody's dealing with this, no matter what industry you're in. So let me get the first question. This one came in, and I think this is really going to be what a lot of people are thinking right now. So Lynn asks, what skills should a leader possess in order to recognize that a crisis is on the horizon? Mm -hmm. You know, sort of a predictive mode. Yeah. So I guess what I'd have to say there is maybe a surprising answer. But I think that the leader needs humility when it comes to their capacity to predict. I really think that once you start trying to predict crisis, you're certain to be wrong. Remember, we're dealing with complexity, which by definition kind of defies our capacity to analyze and know which way it's going. So what I would say instead is that what the, the skill the leader really needs is a kind of confidence, a centeredness, a preparedness that would allow them to respond to the unexpected. But once you start using your scarce cognitive resources to try and predict the uncertain future, I think you're probably distracting yourself from, from the preparation. So be humble enough not to try and predict and instead prepare for a robust capacity to respond in lots of different ways. You know, it's interesting and it leads into this next question what, when I was listening is that it's sort of this balance of a leader having enormous EQ. That has to happen. That has to be something that's you know, stable, but that the IQ part of it needs to be a little more flexible. I mean, would you, you know, like in other words, you, you want other opinions, but a leader still has to be a leader. And I yes. think that's a big point that you made was that it's not about not leading. Right. It's about still leading in that oh, emotional absolutely. intelligent way. Yeah, know? absolutely. So the, the way, what I would say is the leader doesn't have to have all the answers in a moment yes. of crisis. They don't have the right experience, mm -hmm. but the leadership role is critical. You know, so for example, the leader in a moment of crisis takes on real symbolic value. Uh, if the leader panics, if the leader loses self-control, that will be picked up and exaggerated throughout the organization. So in a sense, the significance of the leader may be most important at these moments of crisis. Absolutely. Right. So this is leading to this next question from Jennifer, maybe a little bit of an example here. What is the worst thing a leader can do during a crisis? I think, I or think if you have any examples of things, I, you've think, heard. I think the worst thing the leader can do is panic. Um, it's contagious. Uh, so the challenge, the human challenge at a moment of crisis is that the high stakes and the stress threaten our capacity to be at our best. Now, this is not to say that stress is a bad thing. Some stress is good, but you need some optimal level so people don't become flooded. So the leader is in the unique position to kind of create that optimal balance between being on point and understanding the stakes and not crossing the line of losing self-control and our capacity to operate effectively. And as much as anything the leader says or does, and there's important things they can do to help others do that, strike that balance, I think it's the leader as an example. So don't, don't panic, don't lose your own self-control. And again, this is uh, not only something the leader decides to do in the moment, the leader prepares to do that by understanding herself and preparing the capacity for 
maintaining her own internal compass at these difficult moments. Right. And what about showing vulnerability? In other words, you know, that's different than being out of control, but just kind of giving them a sense that you're feeling their pain too. Yes. Right. Um, it's a delicate topic, but I think you're touching on something very important. Uh, I mentioned the story about um, the Columbia alum who was leading a high, a high stakes team during the Japanese tsunami. Uh, he tells a story in the course of his leadership of actually w at one point breaking down, even crying mm -hmm. um, in a, over multiple days of the highest stress. And he is not ashamed of that. Uh, he's also not claiming that it was the ideal thing to do at the moment, but exposing the human reality, um, he thought the people around him picked up on the significance of that. Mm -hmm. right? So the leader has to show the members of the team that the leaders representing their best interest understands them as kind of full humans. Um, so some human emotion at that time is um, very effective for doing that. And it's authentic. Right. Um, if the leader seemed like a robot, it would inhibit the trust of the rest of the organization. Right. At the same time, um, if the leader is the example about the organization um, being at their best, most of the time the leader wants to be at, at his or her best as well. Right. Doesn't mean emotion shouldn't be part of it, uh, but ideally, even if circumstances are such that there's a kind of breakdown, the recovery and the moving forward quickly, I think would be important. Right, it's jazz. That's I mean, jazz. it's being nuanced and it's being flexible in the moment because you really have to just know your own situation. Mistakes, I mean, no... mistakes will happen. Right. You will take the wrong step. You will right. play the wrong note. Right. The question is, what do you do after that mistake? Right. You don't stop playing. You, you just don't keep stop going. playing. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, in that sense, then, so for a leader who's going through this now, you know, there's a couple of questions here that I uh, came from Lachlan and from Lori. I'm just going to combine them because I mm -hmm. think they're good compliments to each other. As a leader, how do you sustain yourself through significant times and duration of ambiguity, such as an organizational change? And then how do you keep yourself motivated as a leader in a time of crisis? Mm. Because you want to be that benchmark, but what are your philosophy on that? Yeah, yeah, oh, they're great. And I think you're right that they're related. Um, we can put point to something more concrete and something more abstract. The concrete about kind of sustaining yourself in a prolonged episode of, of stress. One of the things that we do, which was certainly when we started doing it at the Columbia Business School, very original, is we started to focus on the well-being, including physical, mental certainly, but physical well-being yeah, of the leader. Right? So actually, in many of our programs, we have end-of-the-day well-being sessions that might involve some uh, calisthenics and some exercise and some activities like yoga and, it's, and advice on things like diet. Leaders have to remember that their capacity to lead is attached to their capacity to be effective humans. Dealing with stress is a function uh, of a lot of that preparation. So you prepare yourself in terms of managing your well being for these unexpected times that you're most stressed. Now, related and dealing uh, also with motivation, I think again, the leader has to understand what her true north is at these moments where it is most likely to be distracted. Right? So the tool we have, and I've really seen its eff efficacy, is helping a leader see her own values. What are her own ultimate ends? Uh, and in a moment of crisis, you can just get distracted and confused and miss that. But when people are reminded of that, it's incredibly motivating. It's really all of our intrinsic motivation is in pursuit of our ultimate values and evoking them and thinking about how they could be exercised in these moments of challenge is really pulls us forward. I love that. And I've, I've mentioned it many times in, in other webinars I've hosted is that that North Star, it's a real guide, you know, that where you say you're North, I mean, just to know when you're having those crisis moments in a crisis to be able to direct you and guide you. So, you know, we've got about 30 seconds left, 30 seconds to a minute. You know, for someone who's going through a crisis today, somebody who's looking at this and saying, what is the first thing you would say personally in the privacy of their own thoughts they should think about right now? If you're in a crisis right now, the preparation for the crisis is gone, the best advice I could give you is uh, realize that you can't and you should not do it alone. Uh, crises will transcend anyone's expert capacity. 
You've got to make the best use of your team. That provides that requires some humility, some openness, providing space for them, and allow the possibility that others may be able to show you the way forward. I love it. I love it. And it sort of uh, goes, you know, the captain goes down with the ship, but it doesn't have to go down alone. <laughs> right? you know, exactly. Paul, this has been great information. I think there's a lot of people out there who are dealing with this presently and really appreciate this information. Thank you for being with us today. Thanks so much, Scott. And thanks all of you for joining us.